Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And thank you also, Monique, for your contribution. I will be uh, addressing some of the same uh, topics and issues that uh, you put forward, uh, especially uh, we'll talk about the distinction between equality of opportunities and equalities of outcomes, and this idea of how the digital transformation of society that we're going through uh, might have implications in terms of how we think about uh, literacy and skills and uh, participation as full citizens in society. So I think you will find these uh, two uh, presentations nicely complementary. What I uh, will be talking about is this kind of uh, the links between social and digital inequalities and the role that digital literacy plays within this kind of digital future, which to some extent is uncertain in terms of that we don't know what it will look like, uh, both in terms of education, but also in terms of our everyday lives and participation in wider society. I will be building on a few research projects that I'm involved in, which have a, a global reach, uh, the From Digital Skills to Tangible Outcomes project, which looks at the links between digital skills, uses of technologies and the outcomes that people achieve uh, uh, with the digitization of society but also uh, the Youth Skills Programme, which is a European programme uh, that looks at the links between digital skills and literacy and well-being amongst uh, European youth. And I will be building on some of the work that I've presented uh, in um, my book that was recently published, The Digital Disconnect, which is really a compilation of the work I've been doing for the last two decades in this area. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of an overview and a definition of uh, digital literacy or digital skills, really, is uh, what it was originally referred to. And when we talk about digital skills, historically, it's been a very heavy focus, especially in the beginning, on technical and operational skills, things like knowing how to turn devices on, uh, but also the kind of more information navigation aspect of that, which is navigating the information that's available through uh, the internet and other uh, digital applications. Um, more recently, there's been a development which has shown that uh, in the current digital world, in which uh, the digital kind of permeates everything that we do in everyday life, there is another set of skills that we really need to look at uh, to be able to understand why uh, people are or are not able to participate in society. So we have this kind of uh, aspect of or domain of communication and interaction uh, uh, related uh, skills and content creation and production related skills. And uh, this content creation and production refers partly to more kind of advanced uh, subjects uh, such as programming, but actually also really has to do with the creation of everyday content and participating in society by contributing uh, something that didn't exist before. Um, so uh, in the Youth Skills Project that um, this framework uh, is part of and uh, was presented uh, in a report that we recently published with my colleagues, uh, Alexander von Dersen, uh, Luke Schneider and Esther von Laer, we uh, say that one of the important distinctions in all of these four domains is not just to look at functional skills, which are the skills that allow us in each of these domains to use technologies in the way that they were designed um, and uh, you know, to have not just button knowledge or uh, kind of uh, simple, kind of more instrumental uh, skills, but also to understand uh, the more critical awareness aspect or the knowledge aspect of this, which goes beyond just being able to use technologies in the way that they were designed towards understanding why they are designed in the way they are designed and how uh, they impact uh, on us and our behaviors and our thoughts and feelings and opinions, but also on, uh, on others and how, uh, so the wider context in which digital technologies are produced and um, are uh, kind of impacting our everyday lives. This is especially important, and this is where I will go towards in my presentation, if we think about the digital future that is coming, where we might not think so much about uh, technologies in the sense of uh, using technologies, and we might think about them more in terms of engaging with uh, digital content and services in, on platforms such as, or in technologies such as the Internet of Things, we will be thinking less about using the technologies and the skills that we need to use the technologies, but how we engage and how we understand how these technologies use our data, for example, or how they shape um, our behavioral and thought patterns. So there is actually quite a lot of development in terms of curriculum and training in the first, first two uh, columns, the technical, operational and information navigation processing kinds of uh, skills, especially in the functional aspect. But there's much less uh, development and thinking around uh, the 
like what in English sometimes would be called softer skills, communication and interaction skills, or content creation and production skills, um, in that more critical sense in particular. And this is important in a number of ways, um, because uh, the way that they are measured and the way that uh, critical skills are evaluated are often through uh, kind of um, these uh, surveys or questionnaires or even tasks that look mostly at those areas. So some people are considered to be highly skilled through specific observation of those areas. But what we see in the Youth Skills Project is that, um, and this again is young people in Europe, is that actually when we look at knowledge or critical awareness, there are much more problematic uh, kind of uh, deficits or a lack of knowledge. What we can see in this graph is that of the 15 um, items that were based on a knowledge test, um, only about half was able to answer um, them, uh, more than half of them correctly. So about half of the students um, or the young people answered, uh, gave the right answer to um, half of them and was, gave a wrong answer to the other half. This kind of also contests the idea that we often see in society about these stark generational inequalities where young people are digitally native and digitally skilled. And so that's one of the first inequalities that I want to uh, uh, kind of debunk in this case, is that young people necessarily know how to navigate. Like they might have these functional skills, they use technologies intensively and a lot, they know how to swipe left, right, up, down, and uh, make the technology work. But in terms of really understanding what the impact is or how to use them in positive ways, there's a lot of lack of knowledge. And sometimes what we see uh, in research is that actually older generations, once they've acquired these technical skills, are much more capable of understanding that wider context because of the kind of uh, more broader understanding they have of society. Another way in which we can look at this is in, in these uh, kind of performance tests that we've uh, developed where we look not only about navigating or um, kind of more these critical literacies in terms of like detecting fake news and understanding news which is or information and where it comes from, which is obviously very important for, uh, for educational context, but also in terms of being able to participate in the learning process and in wider society as societies have become increasingly digital, also in that interaction and communication domain. And, um, what we see there is that, first of all, as researchers, it's much more difficult to develop tools to measure these kinds of skills, but that that in particular in those areas is where students and young people and adults, in fact, uh, lack a lot of uh, understanding about how to navigate um, these kind of communicative spaces and what the impact is of their contributions there. Now, I did say at the beginning that, um, you know, we need to kind of distinguish this, oh yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of another example of the results of that performance test of which I showed some examples. And we can see, in fact, we can see here that, you know, the students get and young people get much less right when we get to the communication, kind of more critical protecting of information and the interaction netiquette in terms of how to interact with others. They get many more uh, uh, kind of, or are not able to complete these performance tests for those specific areas of skills than they are for the more traditional technical skills and um, uh, functional skills in relation to uh, information that we saw here. Let's see here on the left hand side of this slide. Well, in my research, you know, this is very important and we think about how to develop measures of skills of different kinds and we emphasize that all these skills are needed to be able to uh, function and participate in a digital world. My real interest is not so much in who does and who doesn't have the skills or who is and is not, or if somebody is or is not able to use technologies. In fact, I am more interested in how these are unequally distributed. And to be able to understand how I understand digital literacy as beyond those skills, I want to present you with a, a definition that um, that is kind of the origin of that definition of digital literacy and then move on to explain how that is different from understanding this in the context of inequalities. Um, so the original definition historically was the ability to use ICTs, information and communication technologies. More recently, we have started talking about that this should also include the ability to decide not to use technologies um, when they might not be the best way to engage with learning or with others or with society more in general. And this is important because we are interested in digital skills, not 
in and of themselves, or, uh, but because they allow us to achieve certain outcomes in everyday life that is increasingly digital. So this ability to use ICTs or decide not to use them should be always be put in light in ways that allow individuals to obtain beneficial outcomes across all domains of everyday life and not just, for example, in education, but also in terms of um, uh, well-being and other areas. And importantly, to avoid negative outcomes. What we see in education with young people is that often we focus on those negative outcomes and avoiding ne negative outcomes and less on how to achieve beneficial outcomes. What we see in research and interventions with adults is that often in our drive to get people skilled and upskilled to be able to participate in the learning and the workforce and things like that, the focus is on beneficial outcomes rather than on the negative outcomes that also come with participation. So when we have a definition of digital literacy, we need to look at both sides, you know, the ability to use or decide not to use, the ability to achieve beneficial outcomes and avoid negative outcomes. Um, and I have to say here, and that's where I will come to at the end of my presentation, not just negative outcomes for yourself, but also as citizens, negative outcomes for other people. Then, in light of the uh, kind of my uh, reference to a changing or uncertain digital future, these abilities, or these skills need to be uh, not just related to the technologies that we're using right now or the platforms that we're using right now, but also to the technologies that we will be using in the f future. And for those of you who are curriculum developers or interested in uh, kind of educational uh, uh, pedagogies, this means that we should talk about lifelong learning, but also, importantly, about transferable skills. Um, which is a kind of language that is, uh, got lost a little bit, but that is very important in terms of digital literacy. We don't want somebody to be able to use just the platform that they are familiar with right now, but also uh, kind of recognize a platform that might be used for interactions as uh, being uh, suitable to apply certain skills that you uh, learned in the future. In traditional terms, we don't want to, people to just be able to read Donald Duck, we want them to be able to read Donald Duck, but then also to use those same skills to use um, um, other novels that might appear in the future or other comics or whatever it is that um, we decide to produce or text in a digital environment. As I already said, digital literacy goes a little bit beyond this kind of traditional um, definition of digital skills. And um, when I talk about it, I talk about it in the light of um, inequalities because I'm not really interested in whether somebody has or doesn't have the skills. I am interested in whether there are systematic differences in both the opportunity and the ability to use ICTs to achieve those beneficial outcomes and avoid the negative ones. So I'm not interested in differences per se between individuals, but I'm interested in how systematically between different social demographic groups, social cultural groups, or between different regions in the world, these abilities and opportunities are unequally distributed. Um, and that means that there are structural um, things in place that prevent people from achieving these equal outcomes in society, if there are systematic differences in these opportunities and abilities. So to come back uh, again to a little bit to what uh, Monique was saying in her uh, presentation, here the distinction between opportunity and outcome is actually fundamental, because what we see is a lot of policies focused on equality of opportunity in the digital space, and that's something I will unpack in my next uh, kind of uh, part of the presentation. But there's actually little uh, understanding of how these equalities and opportunities and digital opportunities might not lead to people having the same opportunities to achieve beneficial outcomes across all domains of everyday life. Yeah. So this is the framework that we use for the projects the From Digital Skills to Tangible Outcomes project. It's a, a model that stands at the basis of the book that I just published. And it starts from the premise that historically resources, uh, nothing to do with digital resources, have been unequally distributed due to kind of these historical processes and structures and systems that have been in place that have created levels of inequality based on a very variety of um, different background characteristics or uh, geopolitical uh, kind of processes that have taken place. Now, when we think about uh, digital opportunities and this in the digital inequalities literature is kind of called the first level of digital inequalities, is that these uh, inequalities, existing inequalities between groups, between regions, uh, have a strong correlation with or influence um, the kind of differences in access, 
the quality of access, how ubiquitous it is, can we access it whenever we need, how much autonomy we have over that access, and also the way that people stand uh, or perceive technologies and what should be done with them, or what is appropriate to be done with them, or what they can do with them. Yeah. So what, how they are motivated to use technologies. So again, coming back to the systematic bit, I don't necessarily, I'm not concerned if one person has high quality access and another person doesn't have high quality access. What concerns me as a researcher is that these inequalities are systematic and that we can see, especially at this first level, that economic inequalities, poverty, is one of the strongest predictors of inequalities in access. And that um, kind of, uh, kind of uh, positions of power um, in society, so what, let's call them social or cultural resources, are very strongly related to differences in disposition, attitudes and motivation. To come back to the discussion of, of agency and choice, we see that agency and choice is often shaped by these historical processes and structures. So that even though everybody has uh, equal opportunities, that could be a policy, to provide equal access, uh, that often the kind of perceptions of technologies, what you're supposed to do with them, the motivation to use them, are unequally distributed in the sense that some people think that it's more appropriate for them to use technologies, or, and that's the next step in this uh, model, where we come to the fundamental aspect of digital literacy or skills, that, um, that certain, uh, having technical skills or, uh, or kind of these even more softer creative skills with technologies are linked to different kinds of backgrounds and that certain people are supposed to have skills or acquire skills more easily than others. And so these things are related, right? These are sequential processes. Um, besides the fact that your skills are influenced by the type of access we have, there's now a lot of research coming out, and we've seen this during the pandemic, that uh, people who have just access to mobile phones, who rely heavily on their mobile phones with the small screen and their limited functionality, actually are less likely to acquire skills uh, to the same extent as people who have multiple platforms that are uh, available to them wherever they are, whenever they need to, and who have autonomy over devices. So we've actually seen some studies in the UK um, through Ofcom, the communications regulator, where they call, uh, where they see, a, a, in fact, a function of de-skilling with uh, access only to mobile phones, because people uh, learn how to use a particular app, but they don't have these transferable skills that I was talking about, and then they will be able to use that app and not move on to use um, other apps because they learn how to use a particular platform rather than to understand the broader context of um, how the technology is designed. Now in this, and I've already started talking and referring to that, uh, that why is this important? Because both access, your attitudes or dispositions to its technologies and your skills determine to a large extent how you are able to engage with technology. Those with high levels of skills, um, with good quality access that's ubiquitous, are able to engage in very broad ways. They are able to also uh, be engaged with technologies in an involved way, in a sense that it's not just passive use of technology, but also use of technology in which we are contributing to creating uh, this digital world that uh, we are now increasingly living in. While that is a sequential step, this first level of access and dispositions and the kind of skills and engagement, they're all cumulative, yeah, and they, they sum up and they are related to each other. If you lack access, then it's more difficult for you to build skills. If you lack skills, it's more difficult for you to engage in these ways. There is also an independent relationship still with these economic, social and cultural uh, resources that people have. And this comes back to the fact that actually equality of opportunity in terms of skills and access and dispositions is not enough for people to engage in ways that are uh, fulfilling and broad. And that brings me to the final level of this model. And here you can see why the project is called the From Digital Skills to Tangible Outcomes Model uh, project. It's because um, we see that all of these things, access skills, dispositions, the availability of content that's relevant and well-designed, of course, these are all important for people to achieve positive outcomes in their everyday lives in digital societies. But we still, even with equality of opportunity, we see an inequality of outcomes. And uh, some of this also has to do with how we have thought about literacy and skills, but a lot of it has to do with those things that we cannot address 
through education or teaching uh, in particular, as Monique already mentioned, it has to do with other stakeholders and other fundamental systematic inequalities in society, which means that this really has to be a multi-stakeholder approach, that there are different organizations within society that can uh, help at different stages of this model. So skills, access, the right availability of content are fundamental to achieving equality in well-being and in participation uh, and in belonging to a certain society, but they on their own will not be enough. Having said that, this is a presentation about digital literacy and about inequalities and skills, so I will focus on how skills and literacy are related to achieving different outcomes and how that might mean that we need to look at this in different ways. Okay. So I'm going to leave this up for one minute for you to think about yourself. Uh, for, you, know, you can put it in the chat, but uh, I, uh, I will come back to this at the end of the presentation where hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions is that what we see here is that um, we know that there is a difference in this uh, world of uh, digital literacy between the confidence that people feel in the skills that they have and the actual skills that they have. And that inequality is often more at the level of self-confidence than it is at the level of skills, interestingly enough, if we measure skills through things like performance tests. So um, I this is always the, the tricky thing of finding the right kind of symbols or icons to represent different types of groups, right? So what you see on the left, uh, and I hope nobody's offended by this, but is a distinction between uh, uh, young women and young men, or men and women. And uh, then we see in the middle, in the blue, we see uh, the distinction with uh, people from uh, ethnic minorities versus ethnic majorities. And then on the right-hand side, we see the distinction between people who have a little bit less money and people who have... Um, uh, much more money or wealth in society. So I would like you to think just one second for yourself on which of these um, groups are likely to have higher levels of confidence um, and which of them are likely to have higher levels of skills. So I'm going to give you one second while I take a sip of my water to do this for yourself in your room or in your office or in your bed or on a chair, wherever you are following this. So I will show you now the results. These come from a, a study that's done with young people who are not in education, employment, or training in the UK, the Disto Needs Project. And this is what we found. It's that when we look at self-confidence, girls have much lower level of self-confidence in terms of their digital skills. However, when we measure actual skills through performance tests, we can see that girls actually have higher levels of skills. When we look at self-confidence between people from ethnic majority and minority groups, like overall, they are quite similar. However, when we look at skills, actually it looks, and this, we're talking here at this stage still about the more technical skills which have been most commonly measured uh, through these projects or where interventions have been directed at, we actually see that um, uh, people from ethnic minority groups are less likely to have these uh, actual skills, even though they feel that they can participate. When we, come, when we look at you know, traditional socioeconomic inequalities, we see that those who come from more impoverished backgrounds, those who, people who come from uh, backgrounds of homes with lower education, both lack confidence and lack skills. So you can already see that interventions might, if they measure just self-confidence or if they measure just skills, might be uh, not looking at the right thing. And if you think about it in education, some groups might need more attention to being taught uh, specific uh, skills, while others need to have a boost in self-confidence, which will, because the problem is with self-confidence, it's a motivator, right? And that this was already explained very well by Monique, that if you lack self-confidence, even if you have the skills, you're m less likely to continue to develop and to, to uh, feel positive about your participation in these environments. Um, but on the, uh, that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, it's also that other people, if you lack self-confidence, are less likely to see you as a reference point for digital skills. So we, we see with boys and girls, for example, that even the girls who have higher skills are almost never asked for their advice. Yeah, so they, they are almost never asked to explain things to other people in a classroom or in other settings. I will move on now in the, last, uh, in the second half or the last part of this presentation to talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, skills, literacy and different types of outcomes. So I'll start with the positive outcomes of learning and employment. And we can see here that um, you know, to 
to, in terms of the motivation to take tech-related courses, that we see how important self-confidence is, but we also see how important these kinds of perceptions are of who is uh, supposed to be tech-savvy. Anna actually was pretty good at using technologies to get what she needed. She says, you know, I need to know at least enough to take care of myself, for example, when I need to find direction. I focus on what I really need to know. It's a very instrumental kind of uh, th way of thinking about technologies. But when she talks about the men in her life or the men in society, she says, like, you know, they, they have this ability to, uh, you know, to, they are up to date. And my son, too, is really kind of on board, right? My, my boyfriend. These are the people I go to to ask questions. So we often see that, especially in informal environments, where informal learning about technology, uh, kind of a joy of working with technologies take place, that these kind of stereotypes or these kinds of ideas of who is supposed to be good with technology filter through. And this is something that we can see in the research. This is uh, from the book, The Digital Disconnect, is we can see that in societies, um, like that the relationship between problem-solving skills in a society and average digital skill levels is particularly high for uh, the kind of informal skills that allow you to participate um, outside of formal settings. And in formal settings, we are often required to, uh, uh, to learn certain skills because we are, you know, everybody's talking about upskilling, participation in the workforce, but these don't actually correspond with the kinds of skills that people feel like they really need to participate fully in society and to be full citizens. And we can see that, you know, not just at the regional level, but also for individuals, kind of traditional uh, problem-solving skills, traditional levels of education are very much associated with um, these kinds of um, skills that allow you to just participate in everyday life rather than in very formal settings, which is pushed upon from the bottom. There's very clear sequencing in this. So you are less likely to live in environments where these skills are naturally acquired, yeah? And you are less likely to apply them to take advantage of the kinds of learning opportunities that are online. So even if you have the skills um, and you, know, you go online and you have access, people from backgrounds that have historically been disadvantaged in terms of access to education or access to kind of economic resources tend to be less likely to take up educational opportunities online and to really explore kind of creatively learning by doing online. So the other area of positive outcomes is actually for me, this is one of the most important areas of both skills and outcomes of use. And this has to do with the creation uh, and, uh, of content and part active participation in digital spaces. Um, that is the kind of, because creating content and participating actively is what shapes the digital world, not just for ourselves at the moment that we are participating and creating, but also for everybody who comes after us. Yeah. What we see here is that um, the basic types of skills are actually very quite highly correlated with more advanced content creation skills, uh, which might technically be called um, programming skills. And one of the problems is, is that both the basic content creation skills and these really high-level programming skills are very much focused on the technical, more high-level distribution. What you don't see in this graph is things like um, this example from Yun Wen, is that um, people are, who are able to create content and who have the skills, but who don't create content in ways that are appealing to other people or that conform to the norms of, um, uh, that are there about people like them and what kind of content they need to create, is that, um, like as you Wen, who is a, a young uh, gay man in China, participating also in, in gaming and in other actively uh, uh, participating in music communities, is that he has to censor himself in terms of what he creates in certain types of environments. Right? And these are the kinds of everyday, like in terms of creating an avatar or in terms of sharing experiences, because it doesn't correspond to what is expected of a, a gay man like him in, in these environments. So it's these everyday content creation skills in combination with the norms about what you are supposed to create when you come from certain backgrounds that actually shape these inequalities. Yeah, and these are about critical understanding. Yun Wen has quite a high critical understanding of what is expected of him. But then that means actually this critical understanding is that means that he gets excluded. Another example is in more terms of civic participation. Priya, uh, an Indian woman from actually quite a higher socioeconomic uh, status in India, but a very traditional family, um, 
uh, and in a country where you know uh, overt po political participation might not be um, desired or uh, expected, especially of women in her position, is that she also finds that when she tries to participate, um, and she is all for freedom of speech, that um, that she is silenced in some ways by the way that other people act and the way that other people react. Not maybe explicitly trying to bully her into silencing, but really kind of not giving her the opportunity to feel comfortable in those uh, digital spaces. So she says, if somebody's got an opinion, like a political opinion or any opinion about human rights, you can't squash it. Yeah, she is, she is very much in, for, in favor of freedom of expression, but there is a way in which they can say it that would perhaps be not be off-putting to people like me. And I want to put that in the context. It's not that she's offended by what they say, but that the language and the way the communication takes place, the way that she's not listened to, or that way in which when she participates in certain ways, she is silenced. That is bothering her. What we see in this space is that the traditionally privileged have both more self-confidence, feel more respected, and feel like they belong more into these participatory uh, spaces, and which then prompts them to produce their own ideas and contents, uh, you know, which kind of reinforcing, reinforces their experiences. Um, and uh, that this, this kind of active participation, putting certain lifestyles, certain experiences forward, can uh, silence others who don't see themselves represented in this or who receive negative or no feedback on their participation. And so, this brings me to the last type of outcome that I want to discuss, which is the more social psychological outcomes. And there's a lot of talk about this recently, especially when we think about uh, Facebook and uh, the kind of, uh, kind of uh, court cases and regulations that are now trying to be put in place, um, is this area of lack of self-esteem or bullying and the relation that it has to psychological problems, social support and the skills that people have. Carol is a woman who has moved from a, a, a village, or a young woman, who's moved from a village to a big city in Sao, uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, she has a slight lisp. Uh, she doesn't feel she has an accent because she, she doesn't come from the big city. And um, she's very careful in how she manages so, uh, her Facebook and WhatsApp uh, groups. So she has only people that she knows uh, that I've gone to school with in the past, because that's where she comes from, where she feels comfortable, people that she's been with, people that I talk to all the time and stuff like that. So what we see that she actually has quite a high, high level of this kind of interactional literacy to be able to prevent her from being bullied. She knows that she needs to stick with what she knows. What we see in this research is that those with the strong support networks, with supportive environments at home, at work and at school, um, have very different experiences um, online than those who are emotionally, perhaps, or kind of in terms of their home environments, is a little bit more uh, challenged or disadvantaged. Um, that even when they are bullied, the way that the outcome that that the impact that that has on their lives can be very different depending on their offline circumstances. So we can't just look at what happens in that digital world. We need to understand how the digital and the offline interact. What we can see here, and this is might be, some, when I present this, often people are very surprised, is that people with high levels of digital skills um, don't always manage to avoid these negative outcomes. That acquiring high levels of technical skills, which is what we've been measuring mostly, rather than these critical skills that Carol just showed, um, is that those people with high digital skill levels and high levels of uh, psychological problems, like emotional problems, um, are the most at risk of having negative outcomes. So for the group of people who has social psychological problems, actually acquiring a lot of technical skills makes them engage more intensely with that digital world, but because they might not have the kind of social emotional support structures um, in place, they are not able to deal with the kind of uh, bullying that takes place, and they are more likely to be bullied as well uh, because these patterns repeat themselves online. So this creates uh, vicious cycles where psychological vulnerability leads to a greater reliance on mediated uh, social interactions for validation, but they are also more likely to get negative feedback and interactions, which then again lead to lower feelings of self-esteem and uh, lower levels of si social psychological well-being, which then makes them rely more on technology because they don't have that support and they don't get that kind of validation in their offline lives. 
One point I want to say here, and this is important when we think about it in education and in terms of skills, the focus often is on trying to deal with anonymity and unknown others. But what we actually see, and again, this is important, especially in school context, is that um, you know, the most damaging interactions um, is for people who, uh, or for the kind of small, everyday, continuous forms of exclusion and intimidation that might be not so explicit, and that the people who are committing these uh, kind of um, acts of, uh, of uh, subtle violence against others or exclusion against others are often also not aware of the impact that their behavior is having. Yeah? So the impact that ignoring, uh, disliking, or innocent jokes or gags in these environments have on different people can be... Um, can be much more impactful sometimes than the anonymous other where uh, you feel uh, backed up by um, people in your environment. And this is something that brings me to uh, why this is important, that we realize that um, like the skills that are actually important to be able to make positive contributions to the digital world, but also to have positive experience when we are in the digital world, um, are going to be... Um, kind of are going to have to move away from that technical and functional kind of understanding that we've had so far. And if we think about the image that many people might have of a digital future when we talk to people, policymakers, parents, is that they have this feeling that we're going to disappear into this digital world, right? We're going to all walk around with headsets, we're going to be just virtual. But actually what we've started to realize with research and with developments of technology, that the digital world is going to look more like this kitchen, where actually the digital is invisible, the virtual is invisible, and it's embedded in our devices. Yeah. So the devices will do the thinking for us. We will not have to push a lot of buttons. Things just supposedly work, right? Um, and we can already see that with things like the Internet of Things, where you, know, you don't have a great, like a very long manual to make it work. You might have to do some work to connect it to the Internet, if that's what you're thinking. But then after that, um, it does the thinking for you. So critical skills, critical awareness, yeah, knowledge and awareness on top of some, some kind of still functional skills or technical skills are going to be of fundamental aware, uh, importance to understand um, the impact that the digital is having and how we can engage in positive ways and avoid these negative ways. This is also a call for that this is not something that is about people without skills catching up because the creation, the, the data that gets fed into these uh, invisible uh, uh, embedded technologies are created by all of us. It's how we interact, what we like, what we do, how we talk to our artificial intelligence, who has the power to decide where these technologies work, who is the person in the household who, has the, who is the owner of this kind of um, setting, even if, though it's invisible. Like, it becomes um, much more about all of us creating an awareness. So let me move on to some conclusions about the lessons learned in this research. It is clear that those who have been historically disadvantaged are less likely to translate the use of ICT into high quality outcomes and are more likely to have negative experience, even with high skill levels. So this is where we need to teach people skills, but we need to be aware that teaching people skills is not going to solve some of the other more fundamental problems. Yeah? And, and People who just teach technical skills in particular need to be aware of this. Digital literacy education should go beyond teaching just these functional skills to forge a citizenry that's ready for that digital future. Right? Critical literacy, which allows us to not just passively use technology but to co-create it, are fundamental. And then one of the things that I haven't touched upon that much, but formal education around digital skills is actually unlikely to achieve greater inequality on its own, especially in this future where technologies are embedded, because we learn informally by looking at other people at home, at school, and how they are using technologies in terms of what is appropriate, what should we be doing, what is positive interaction. So if the right content is not online, and people's social digital ecologies, the places they live and work, do not stimulate learning, then digitization is unlikely to lead to positive outcomes. So my call to action is, is that actually the digital future starts really in a school or a home or a network, yeah, somewhere near us, yeah, and that how we, can, I'm going to assume this about us, is that we are more advantaged. How we use technology impacts not only our own lives, but also those of the future generations and those others in less fortunate positions. And we need to be aware of this, that 
and that, that is digital literacy, that the emphasis should be on all of us to acquire this kind of awareness and knowledge, and that we take collective responsibility to make these constructive contributions to these developing digital ecologies. And I'll finish here with my presentation. <laughs>